The question that concerns us most is, is this the last half of a larger seven years? It certainly is because the, set, the, the sacrifice that's taken away here, we're going to make a case, it's the same sacrifice that's taken away in Daniel 9. It's got this flood, it's got this covenant, it's got this man of sin. It's this, it's, there's two mysteries here. God is not content until both are accomplished in history. There's the mystery of godliness, we have that the first coming. There's the mystery of iniquity, we wait for that. And this whole thing is constructed around two princes. They have a heavenly counterpart and an earthly. There's an incarnation. Yes. Christ, the Messiah, the prince, the prince that shall come. The prince that shall come is the little horn. And it, makes, it, it just adds right up. And the little horn, how long does he prosper and practice? Three and a half years. When, when does that happen? It's when he stops the sacrifice. And in all these references, you'll see that the sacrifice is always and invariably. It, you know, if there's, any, if there's any exception, it would only be this one. But in all the other instances, and that's all we have to compare with, the sacrifice is stopped by the one that magnifies himself, the one that exalts himself. Yes. So that's all to say that well, I think we have here in verse 26 sort of a, a preview of what's actually accomplished in the middle of the week in verse 27, just like we have here in 22. And Daniel 12, we just read mm -hmm. Daniel 12, 11, the, uh, the, the, uh, the sacrifice is taken away and that starts that last three and a half years. But if you look up it's in that same chapter, the end of that 1290 days is the resurrection of the dead. Yes. Verse 2, it's the destruction of Antichrist, this guy that's broken without hand. It's the deliverance of Daniel's people and even Daniel's personal resurrection in verse 13. Amen. So you can't spiritualize this unless you've also got Daniel spiritualized and a resurrection that happened some other time in antiquity. Mm. It, you know, this is mm. such a, you guys need to know how to prove this because this is so contested. And if this is taken from the church, it sounds so mechanical, so technical, so tedious. I understand. It doesn't even sound prophetic. It doesn't, it's not pastoral. It's none of that. It's academic. But it's critical to where the church is going. You take this away from us and, and, the, and the ability to recognize distinct things and know it, I know you could say, oh, you can do it by the Spirit, but God is glorified when His Word is fulfilled. Yes. And, and He doesn't just yes, want amen. a few, a few yes, guys yes. who can say, hey, the, I've been to the mountain and here's God's Word. He wants you guys to be able to check this stuff out and prove all things so that we're all saying the same thing amen. because we have a common currency, the Word of God. Yes. So it's worth the effort. It's amen. worth you know, the strain and the eye strain and checking out some stuff. Be ready to give an answer because these things are difficult. Have respect and patience for those that differ, but also be ready to give a an account. Amen. They are hidden of God. God made this hard. Yes. This is not sloppy uh, work here. This is delicate, yeah. divine, yeah. sovereign grace, I mean sovereign Holy Ghost stuff that God has made it where you can easily stumble. You can easily miss it. Okay, we've got three, three hands up. Philip, did you get the word? Okay. Okay. And we're going to get to your questions. I just want to make one comment. The, the flood that's talked about in Revelation 12 ties right in also yeah. ah, to yeah. the time, times, and half a time. Revelation 12, uh, verse 14. The serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that she might, he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. That happens right after uh, uh, the woman goes into the wilderness. The second half of the week. The flood of persecution. One, okay, pardon. Well, there, there's, we got a second for just yes. one more point. In Daniel 9.24, um, you know what, we could come back to that. But there's some rich things here that we shouldn't pass over too quickly. Right. This issue of the sealing of the vision, there's some insights by Kyle and Dalich and some others I wanted to suggest to your consideration. And the issue of the everlasting righteousness and the issue of the covenant. It's true that, that through and only through Christ this everlasting righteousness comes. And it absolutely did come. It, and was revealed to the church, and we see that in Pentecost and ever since, and we're here this day by reason of this, of this everlasting righteousness. But we want to show that this, is, this must happen for Israel, that the covenant's not complete until it's been fulfilled. And so at some point, maybe not even here, but, but you need to go back and see what this everlasting covenant was with Israel, because this is what yes, Daniel yes, had in mind. Yes. The same Daniel that's talking about Jeremiah's 70 years is the same Daniel that was fully conscious of Jeremiah's everlasting covenant. So to go and see what that is, you, you, there, it brings a richness out of what the 77s is given to bring in. And what's come to us at the end of the 69th week, brothers and sisters, will come to them at the end of the 70th. 
And until that time, God's face is hidden from them. And we are that foolish nation that's making them, you know, that was given to make them jealous. Mm -hmm. It's just so precious. It's, yes, it's, it the, it's just all the coming of, you know what it's all is? It's all the fulfillment of Amen. Moses. Moses is the guy that started all this. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as far as the humanity issue. But it goes back, of course, to Abraham. But I mean, Moses, what he said is exactly what this whole covenant thing is about this, that we're seeing in the 77s. Uh, Brother Steve, you had your hand up. So the, you mentioned uh, there was a confusion of with on uh, chapter 9, verse 24, actually 26, of who would be the, who would be the one who sees the sacrifice. Well, 26 clearly is the destruction of Jerusalem. I'm sorry, 27. 26 sounds like the, that the Jerusalem was already destroyed, destroyed before 27. Yeah. And I'm suggesting that it's anticipating of, the, of what happens more particularly in the middle of 27, that this is sort of a pre-announcement. Yeah. This tells you the who and the what, mm -hmm. and verse 27 tells you the when. And I was showing other examples. You have that... You yes. have that in Daniel 11, and we could so, show it in Daniel 12 also. There's like a, a snapshot or a yes. picture, this and then the prophet perfect. drops back. And in the book of Revelation, you have, you have uh, different, you know, you start way back with the seals, and you move to the same place. And closer in, you come with the trumpets. In other words, the same three and a half years, the woman in the wilderness, he keeps dropping back and running at the same goal over and over again. And I think you have that right here. So the first coming of the had nothing to do with the... Uh, uh, Seats of sacrifice. At the first coming of the sacrifice was not stopped until 70 AD. So the first coming of Christ was fulfilled 40 years before the sacrifice was stopped. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Father, you raised this question. I think what you meant to say was before the discussion, uh, Reggie stated that there were two options. One, a small p, is it the Antichrist or is it Jesus that stops the sacrifice? And I want to continue with that because when you read, in it, uh, when you read in verse 27, the desolation is also poured on him, meaning that it has to be the Antichrist. So my question is, why is it that there are two views? Knowing that 27 is self explanatory. Well, that's the whole debate. Uh, yeah. To many people, it seems obnoxious that we advocate a gap here. They make great sport of that because we believe that if this is a future Antichrist, well, then the 70th week could no more follow the 69th than the, than the advent and career of Antichrist could come immediately after the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. So you've got to posit a gap here somewhere. And we're saying there's nothing unusual about a gap in prophecy. You've got it between Rome and chapter 2. You've got it between Greece and chapter 8. And again, you've got the mysterious gap to be found somewhere between antiquity and eschatology in chapter 11. And this could be, this phenomenon can be shown over and over again through scripture. We call it the, the mystery of the parenthesis. And of course, the parenthesis is not a mystery gap or a church age, as some are teaching. We actually believe it's the time that Moses said that Israel would be moved to jealousy with another people. Yes. You know, so this is the time that God is giving to the calling out of the Gentiles. Well, so we believe it's completely in keeping with the, with the character of prophecy to advocate, first of all, a mystery that God himself is the author of, that we wrestle with. Secondly, a gap is not unusual. And the other thing is, is that there's no other instance where the sacrifice is stopped by anyone except the prince that magnifies himself. In Daniel, in Daniel 8, 11, and 25, in Daniel 11, verse 31, in Daniel 12, 11, it's always the bad guy. So this would be the one exception, uh, and if this is, but the, they believe that Jesus, by his cross, stopped the sacrifice. They know very well that the literal sacrifice continued 70 years. They're also forced themselves to advocate a, da a, a gap, because they have to leave the, the, the 70 weeks, as they believe, fully fulfilled at, at, right after the cross of Christ, and jump out 40 years later for the destruction of Jerusalem. So you don't have a need. But in our view, the destruction of Jerusalem, that was pre-typical of a destruction that must come in the middle of the week at a future Antichrist, fulfilling a future mystery for which the age waits. So it's a, it's a choice. I hear the spirit of what you're asking. You're asking, really, uh, why are they doing so many spiritual and uh, hermeneutical gymnastics to come up with another view? 
when yes. there seems to be one, and they are. And that's the problem. I think that's what Reggie just described. Yes. They're doing some amazing. But let's understand. There's a me there's a measure. It's pretty appealing. You know, Jesus did have a three and a half year ministry mm -hmm. after the baptism of John, oh. and he did satisfy forever the demand for sacrifice. There's some wonderful parallels, and I think we need to appreciate. Maybe maybe there's more here than you know. But what we can't give up was his ministry would be the years. issue that the sacrifice that's stopped here starts a last three and a half year period to surrender that. Yeah. And then also what that also does, it, it, it surrenders the idea that we can see a covenant confirmed, with a, a, a covenant with death and hell that will begin that last three and a half count years countdown. That, 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 therefore, this interpretation can potentially, one way or the other, rob the church of critical advance alert and critical preparation. We believe that there's a relationship between the travail of the woman and the urgency during that first three and a half years because God's pe true remnant people will know that the tribulation is approaching, you know, within just three and a half years. So it's, it's entirely future. Peter's been waiting for quite a while, and then I'll get to yours. Peter? Uh, in verse 27, but doesn't it also include, as part of that summary, the destruction of the destroyer, just like in Isaiah 33? Yeah, yes. the, the, the Assyrian, I think, in Isaiah 33, he's destroyed without a hand by the breath of the Lord, right? He who destroys what he destroys. Right. And it goes all the way back to the, the yes. whole chapter ends with the whole restoration of the river flowing out of the city. But uh, it seems like in uh, chapter 27 here, it says, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Yes. So this looks like this also includes the destruction on the, on the Antichrist. Yes. And again, the one who are, if, if you have it, you know, Titus, it would be Titus. But yeah. And we, we've but, proven that all of Daniel's visions end with the second coming of Christ. Yes. Who destroys the destroyer? Jesus with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Well, yes. That, that makes me question then uh, the timing that you were placing on this. I understand because this is sort of like... I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you what I told you, you know, the way of presenting things. And this is, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. And he tells you, and then he summarizes it up in more detail in, in chapter 12. Yeah. And so this is, uh, this is just like a, a, a summarization of what he's going to say. So I didn't know that you could put any specific timing on this particular verse, since it covers the... Well, he says he confirms the covenant for one week. Jesus confirmed the covenant forever. It wasn't a limited one-week thing. And this covenant that's confirmed for one week has a middle point. point. And that middle point is, is marked by the taking away of the sacrifice. And in all the other three references in 8 and 11 and 12, that begins the last three and a half years. So if the last three and a half years starts with the taking away of the sacrifice, and the covenant here, and the flood, and all that we see again in chapter 11, and the league that's made with him starts a period leading up to the middle of the week. It's reasonable to understand that, there, that the, the covenant is confirmed at the point of the beginning of, a, of an entire seven-year period that's divided in half. The last half is the, is the uh, abomination and the, uh, the destruction of the Antichrist. So you, 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 we need to what, we're say what I'm saying here is we need to line up the taking away the sacrifice with every other account yeah. of that in the Scripture. And if we do, yeah. we, we are able to see this is the last half of a larger seven-year period. Yes. So this, covers the full, this verse covers the full three and a half years, basically. It covers the full seven years. Seven. Yes. It's what we're saying. It's, you know, oh, okay. verse 27. The away the sacrifice. Of the sacrifice is, yeah. it, it, the, fact, the taking away the sacrifice is, is simultaneous with the abomination, which starts the last three and a half years. The covenant is confirmed to start the seven years. It's broken in the middle of the week. It's violated, desecrated, de you know, and the desolation of Jerusalem is not the whole seven years, it's the last half. I mean, it's, you know, you have to really yes. look at it. But when you look at it, don't look at it just by itself. You don't interpret scripture that way. You go out and you see, okay, where's this abomination? Where's mm -hmm. this sacrifice? Where's this last half of the week? It's given everywhere else as, la as three and a half years. So you just can't put this back at the first. We're looking at three mountain peaks in this, in this nugget of scripture, really, is what we're looking at.